back again. Uh, if you have not forgotten, my name is Mashud Badiri. Uh, I'll be chairing this session, which is going to be the last panel uh, for this conference. Uh, the panel is titled, How Can Africa Claim the 21st Century? I mean, I want to say just a few things about how we came up with the, uh, this title for this panel. But before I do that, um, I'm not speaking now as perhaps maybe one of the conveners or uh, the chair of Center of African Studies. I mean, I personally, I think I've really, really enjoyed uh, the discussions we've had since yesterday and today, especially the last uh, uh, panel. I mean, I do law here, and a lot of the time people talk about law being boring. One of our flagship programs, I mean, courses we teach in the law school here is what we call legal systems of Asia and Africa. So we look at law from, um, uh, from a broader perspective. We have another course here called Law and Society in Africa, which I teach on. Now, um, our colleagues in the law school know me. When we were talking about language, you know, it intrigued me a lot. Because in teaching both my law courses and Law and Society in Africa, I use a lot of African proverbs. I use it a lot. I mean, I, because I come from a very traditional background, I know a lot of Nigerian proverbs. And, I, it makes, and it makes a lot of sense. And it's very, very powerful when you use those proverbs to explain things, particularly to our African, African students. And this is why, perhaps, what, did, what I thought didn't come out very clearly when we were talking about language was we were looking at language much more, language in the sense of literature, literal. You know, in law, as a lawyer, I mean, language also needs to be understood, language in context, language as context. Not necessarily using African language, but um, African language, literally. But sometimes you can speak English, speak English in, in Africa, in, in the African context, in the African sense. And this is where sometimes proverbs, I mean, are very uh, essential in, in that regard. And I hope we have all also enjoyed it. Now, coming to the uh, panel title, most of us who are in development studies, I mean, I use this a lot. People uh, who have heard me speak about law and development, which I teach in the School of Law, this report, I use it a lot. Since we are talking about futures, at the beginning of this century, exactly April 2000, if we remember, a lot of the time, you know, reports come out, we forget about them. There was a report on Africa issued by the World Bank. You can find it on the internet. You know, I, refer, I want people to go back and look at this a lot. And the title of the report was, Can Africa Claim the 21st Century? You know, it's at the beginning of the century. In, it says, Can Africa Claim the 21st Century? It was issued by the World Bank. You know, uh, it raises a lot of questions. I mean, for me, it was a wake up call in relation to, when I said, I mean, what title is this? In relation to, it, it, it tried, it's, a, it's based much more on economics. I've been discussing with Alice in relation to big numbers and things like that. I mean, lawyers don't do numbers, but it was. So it identified the fact that, yes, Africa can claim the 21st century. But then it says it depends on the ability of Africa to overcome the development traps that kept it confined to a vicious cycle of underdevelopment, conflict, and untold human suffering for most of the 20th century. Long English. In one sentence, in one African proverb, I tell this to my students. What it is saying is this. I mean, we need to look, learn from history, isn't it? Learn, look at what has happened in the past so that we don't fall into the same traps. There's a Nigerian proverb that says that when a toddler, when a young person hits his leg, stumbles on something and fall, he will get up, look forward, and just go on. But when an adult, a wise adult, trips and fall, they will look back at what trips them before they move on. You know, so that they can, I mean, it's, it's a very powerful proverb, which says that if Africa is wise, if our leaders are wise, they must act as the wise adult. If you trip, you've made mistakes, you need, don't just get up and go on. You know, you get up and look back. See what tripped you, so that when you pass through that same position again, you will not be tripped and you won't fall a second time. So it's quite essential, and perhaps this is what we'll be doing uh, in this session, whereby we want to look at whether, uh, how can, you know, having heard what has kept Africa uh, um, relatively 
uh, um, in this situation? How can we learn from history? And also, how can we correct the mistakes of the past? Now, the report I mentioned identified four strategies, which will be represented perhaps maybe by the presentations. One, it says, well, for Africa to be able to do this, we need to improve governance and resolving conflicts, improving governance, resolving conflicts. Many conferences, when we talk about governance, we talk buzzwords, very big words. Governance, development. Nobody talks about literature when you are talking about governance. <laughs> Nobody talks about culture when you are talking about development. I mean, it's about the big, big, you know, uh, buzz, what? Now, we will look at that. Then investing in its people. Uh, Africa needs to invest in its people. We've been talking, when we talk about investment in people, a lot of the time, you know, we've been talking about language, the use of language in education. And we don't, I mean, it's about understanding. If you want to really develop, many uh, students, Africa just passed through schools. The understanding because of language, I mean, all these are quite important. This, I was very intrigued by Khadija's point that, well, when policymakers are sitting down making big policies, involve people in culture, people in language, people in arts, involve them in the decision making, it can really go a long way in contextualizing things. Then it also talks about, I mean, increasing competitiveness and diversifying economics, and also reducing aid dependence and then partnerships. So we have tried to reflect uh, this in the panel. Uh, the panel has changed a little bit. My co-chair uh, uh, convening, Andrew Thomas, who is a partner in Hampton and Williams, they do a lot of practical engagement in relation to development, uh, infrastructure, and energy uh, things, advising governments in Africa. So he will be bringing a practical, he'll be doing a substantive rather than just chairing. So, I hope we'll be able to really enjoy uh, this session, which is trying to look at how can, how can Africa claim the 21st century. So the first person, perhaps maybe, who I'll be handing over to will be Alice. Alice will be looking at the Sub-Saharan African's growth paths, the relevance of the concept of cumulative causation, which is an economic thing, but she will try and break it down really easily for us to be able to appreciate. Alice. Thank you very much. I have to thank uh, Angelica very much and the African Studies Center for having invited me. Uh, this is uh, this one. Yes. Can I put it on? Uh, as Professor Baderin mentioned, I will present the macro. The macro facts. Can you put it? Uh, yeah. Uh, some macroeconomic facts regarding Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, I am the boring economist. And these macro facts provide a particular picture in appearance, which is a picture of divergence. So it is a very depressing picture. And then we will see together how to interpret this uh, graph. And we will see that, in fact, we should, uh, this graph can be interpreted in, ex in many, many different uh, ways. First, the issue of d divergence. We will see that the series of uh, graphs regarding Sub-Saharan Africa as a whole are quite depressing and showing a divergence in terms of growth and income uh, regarding Sub-Saharan Africa. Against neoclassical economics, uh, I will argue that a different type of theory, which is what I call the theory of cumulative causation, is much more interesting and relevant for understanding what we will uh, see. And this uh, body of theories of theory relies on a series of concepts, which I find, I think, much more relevant, which are cumulative causation, past dependence, irreversibility, threshold effect, etc., etc. And what is important in this type of uh, uh, concept is the issue of time. Time for neoclassical economics doesn't exist. I mean, growth models usually just say growth is a, is a, is a function of uh, labor, capital, etc., etc. But the issue of multiple equilibria and time is something which is absolutely ignored. And a concept which is quite interesting, I think, is a concept of trap, 
trapping, uh, trapping uh, uh, effect. And I quoted uh, a sentence from uh, Kiminori Matsuyama. What is a trap? If it exists, because you are not obliged to believe in, in uh, traps, self-perpetuating condition whereby an economy caught in a vicious circle. So the interesting concept is the concept of vicious circle, virtues of vicious circle, suffers from persistent underdevelopment. And the interesting issue is that in this type of uh, perspective, small uh, 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 events uh, can induce very large effect and also past dependence. That is, uh, what happened before in the past can comment what will take in the future. The so second interesting dimension of this type of theory, which are completely rejected except at SOAS uh, by mainstream economics, is that if we think causalities in terms of cumulative causation, immediately economics becomes a social science. And economics, as you know, is a very arrogant discipline, considering that all qualitative things are absolutely no, not scientific. And if we think in terms of combination of cumulative causes, immediately we can integrate the fact that causes can be political, social, economic, mental, cognitive, and so on. And this is why this theory, which is defended by complexity economics today, is strongly rejected by mainstream economics. So, first graph, and you will see how this graph, uh, in fact, you don't have to believe in this graph. This is a graph which is terrifying. Uh, this is long-term growth rate of Southern Africa since 1820. You can say where this, com this figure coming from. You're right, we will discuss this. But somebody called Angus Madison, who, 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 who is dead, devoted his entire life to try to calculate growth rate uh, since, by the way, two millennia. And this is the result. We can see that something quite worrying, that is, Africa, by the way, it is not Sub-Saharan Africa, but the data don't exist, uh, disentangling Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, uh, since, let's say, the, the, the beginning of the 20th century seems to diverge. This is a technical word used by uh, economy. Western offshoots are uh, Canada, uh, uh, United States, and so on. If we do the same graph a bit more rec recently, so uh, from the World Bank, World Development Indicators, we see exactly the same thing, which is uh, uh, apparently uh, absolutely depressing view that Sub-Saharan Africa uh, is Sub-Saharan Africa is in red, and we see a, a cardiac encephalogram flat, uh, etc. Something which is extremely strange uh, and, and 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 worrying. And what we observe is exactly the congruence between low-income countries and Sub-Saharan Africa. And immediately, we can start to think and to say, this is a purely tautological reasoning. Because in fact, if Sub-Saharan Africa includes a majority of low-income countries, and if low-income countries with the World Bank classification mostly include Sub-Saharan Afri African countries, except Nepal and Haiti, immediately, we can see that the label immediately creates the fact, you, you see, and linguists uh, will know that much better than me. So, second observation, we can have completely different interpretation uh, of this. That is, who are the non-normal uh, countries? Who are the outliers? You can perfectly say that the tortoise is a very normal type of trajectory. We have majority of countries which are slowly uh, uh, growing, but they grow. Or we can observe that two uh, um, uh, two groups of two types of countries, United States, European Union, in fact, can be considered as outlier. And in this case, we completely reverse the interpretation. And we, can have, we have to explain the exceptional growth of particular uh, uh, country. Okay? So, if we believe in the story of divergence, we have to, I mean, some, some people, including me, say that there is an issue. We, some, some interesting uh, uh, studies show that a key factor for Sub-Saharan Sub Africa has been lack of social change, which has been mentioned yesterday by uh, Chris uh, Kramer, and of course the main, main, main issue, which is dependence on primary commodities. And the first graph of the 19th century, Blattman and other researchers have shown that since the 19th century, what has been called the small 
uh, colonial economy model by A.G. E. Hopkins, for instance, is typically, I mean, a main explanation of this profile of Southern Africa, commodity dependence. Why? Because commodities are fluctuating, price of commodity, and it is absolutely obvious to show that volatility per se has a negative impact on uh, growth. And by the way, you, we can see that it is uh, quite worrying because Africa, Southern Africa, is a fuel exporting uh, region. And if we add metals and ore, it's more than 50% of export in Southern Africa. The consequences are divergence, other type of divergence. We can accumulate the divergence a lot. So a profile of export which is quite worrying as well. That is, over the last 50 years, we can see that the share of export of Southern Africa has declined, including South Africa. Uh, uh, but again, you immediately see that we can exactly say that this is perhaps what we have to explain and not this, because by the way, Latin America is not doing so well. Another graph which is depressing, which is the same decline, showing that, by the way, it is not a problem of performance in export. That is, Sub-Saharan African countries have exported fuel, etc., etc. But what do we see? That is commodity dependence. As soon as we have a shock, 2008, the good years of oil, the 2000s, Angola, Nigeria, Gabon, etc. So good years, and then the shock of the crisis, financial crisis, and then the crisis of today. So we, we can see how it is an issue to be commodity dependent. Then, now we start to discuss this graph. Uh, as I already mentioned, half full or uh, uh, half empty, so this is a quite an important, uh, the tortoise versus, how do you say in English, Achilles, it means it's not exactly the same interpretation. Second, I'm not insisting on that because it is obvious. That is, you can immediately say, what is the value of these figures? And you're right, because, of course, everybody knows who has worked in Africa and statistical department know that the figure can be highly uh, criticized and they, they deserve to be. So I leave aside this, uh, this observation. So, uh, then, uh, something which is a bit more interesting, that is, uh, Level of income, I provide the GDP per capita, which is the level of income, to taking into account the demography, which is welfare of any individual in Africa. But growth rates are not at, at all the same. That is, in Ethiopia, for instance, we will see departing from, let's say, $200 and having later $400 per capita is an extraordinary performance. But the difference is only $200. So we have completely different rankings if we take the two indicators. Another mystery for me is we see something which uh, now, which is really uh, reducing the, the pessimism. We can see that against the World Bank and many, that is, there is absolutely no relationship between the volatility of growth rate and income per capita. Even today, I cannot explain this graph. Because normally, you agree that growth rate should translate in income, China, growth rate, higher income. Here we can see something very bizarre, that is, growth is quite low today for the continent, but we can see that uh, per capita income are increasing. We will leave aside. And now I conclude on something which is, I think, the most important, that is how you should be critical if you read The Guardian or whatever, New York Times or Wall Street or World Bank, uh, World Bank IMF and so on, uh, graphs, that is, how they are presented. And now we leave the divergent story and we enter a different story, which is uh, first aggregate data, and I'm sure that you are thinking these are co may com be completely irrelevant. Only case study, and you will be very happy because anthropologists, geographers, uh, etc., I mean, uh, at SOAS, uh, case study may, may be the only methodology which is relevant. And why? Not only because case study is the most important, taking into account history and so on, but here, if I take, for instance, let's say, non-oil countries, I wanted to take non-oil countries because oil, oil countries have different uh, profile. We immediately see exactly the same sad story, and yesterday Chris Kramer has presented Ethiopia as a success story uh, in a very convincing way, and we see this, that Ethiopia is faring extremely uh, 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 poorly, but you immediately see 
that if we don't include any more richer country, the inclusion of richer country, by definition, flattens completely the performance of one particular country. And he I do exactly the same theory with Ethiopia alone. You agree, we see a completely different story, which is a story, by the way, quite optimistic. And this is the, the, the last slide. So we should, I conclude in saying that cumulative causation may remain relevant and the story of high commodity prices combined, I insist combined, because causes taken in isolation don't matter. It is only at a certain point in space and time that a particular combination of causality can produce a particular result. If you defend this point of view, you don't do any econometrics, because econometrics, by definition, present causalities with coefficient, mathematics, etc., which are across time and space. But if you say that it is only a particular combination of, of events, historical, political, commodity dependence, institution, productivity, etc., you immediately say that ex ante, you cannot say anything about the future. This is extremely important. You can only observe ex post that a particular outcome has taken place. And of course, econometricians, the World Bank and so on, they cannot accept this type of uh, point of view. And we can see so a bad story that commodity price, of course, have influenced growth rate in Africa, and especially the recent uh, period. We can see that growth rate in Africa, in red, very closely follow energy oil price, non-energy. And in fact, why? Because of financialization of commodity today. Exactly, I have just one slide. Uh, uh, financialization since uh, 20 years makes that uh, commodities are now traded as financial assets, which means that the discrepancy we, of, between oil prices and growth rate we found in the 60s as is now over, and we see something which is bad news for Africa, which is uh, really, in this um, concept I like, the issue of lock-in. African countries are really locked by precisely globalization, final association of commodities, and so on, on which, of course, they don't have any control, because the prices of oil are not made in Angola, Nigeria, or elsewhere. And my last slide is, even if there are uh, cumulative causation uh, processes. Again, cumulative causation does not mean determinism. And I think this is one of the key points. As I said before, we can observe ex post particular trajectory, but the fact that we observe like we can get snowball effect, that is trajectory which are heavily dependent on the, on the past, for instance, doesn't mean at all determinism. Why? Because the countries which grew, Asia, China, etc. They did it because of public policies. It, does, it didn't come from, uh, from out of the blue. Uh, and the key uh, founding father of uh, development, development studies after the Second World War recognized and, and, and promoted the view that only public policy and precisely the state, state intervention could implement the big push and reorganize factor of production, labor, and so on in a developmental way. I mean, public policies are key. And as you know, the IFI, the World Bank, and the IMF, precisely at the first crisis uh, in 79, 80, affecting Sub-Saharan Africa because of commodity prices, only because commodity of commodity prices, what did they recommend in the famous adjustment program? the reduction of the state, and precisely the constraint, heavy constraint on public policies. So what I, uh, I conclude here in saying that precisely public policies may have uh, contributed to divergence across region, and we cannot uh, ignore the fact that some poor public policies have been conducted in Africa, this is a, a debate, but exactly symmetrically we can say that Public policies, typically big push or other type of policies, it is naturally a matter of debate, can also break this cumulative causation process. And okay, this is. Thank you very much. Uh, that's quite, I mean, interesting. There's so 
much to be uh, discussed later on that. Um, I will now call on Alicia, who will look at the issue of security challenges um, in relation to the Lake Chad uh, Basin. Alicia. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Swas, for allowing us to be here today. And um, today I'm going to talk about some very issue uh, that I think uh, are uh, very interesting in the relationship between Africa and its future. And uh, not only uh, the relationship between uh, Africa and the global world, that is uh, security and mobility. Um, we, I'd like to begin um, talking about the picture that I put on the on the slide. That is, a, this is a, an internally displaced, displaced person camp in uh, in the Lake Chad, where there is a crisis that is uh, consuming these people in uh, uh, in the department of uh, Mar uh, Dabanchali. This is the name of the locality. I want to draw attention to, the, to this place, to the encampment, and to the IDPs issue, since um, there, is a, there is a lot of evidence that in the future, more and more population is going to inhabit on living more or less permanently in a, in a camp like this. So um, let's begin with the, uh, some theoretical issues. I, I, I want to draw the attention to the um, to this to security because this challenge uh, the objective has been clearly manipulated for political reasons and this has happened clearly in the Sahelian states where I conducted fieldwork and where my research for the PhD is taking place um, that is uh, Chad and Niger and um, and Nigeria somehow. The, the 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 manipulation of the security concept has has come under has, uh, has come under political pressures from the international donor community and the uh, European Union, uh, moreover, and uh, uh, through other uh, international organizations. The participation of many of these countries in the in the in the in military programs and in counterterrorism programs uh, as as threatened and politically legitimated governments and leader, uh, leaders which have uh, let's say a, a bad records in terms of accountability and human rights uh, a parallel yet converging narrative about states effective rule of law and exercise of sovereignty in the, in the mostly desertic or, or semi-desertic areas of the, of the Sahel, underpins discourses regarding security and mobility, which are the issues I'm talking about today. This, uh, this narrative about the uh, effective exercise of sovereignty in these areas, which have, called, which have been called in uh, different manners, uh, and uh, are still on the top of the interest of the uh, major um, international organization, and not only even uh, uh, the, the, the United States and uh, European Union. Um, uh, as, as brought to um, uh, greater border controls, uh, and uh, repressive exit visas, which are uh, me measures uh, which are implemented actually in uh, several states. Uh, as for example, it is not part of, uh, of the Sahel uh, of the Sahel Strip, but uh, Eritrea is the the most uh, striking uh, example. And um, other forms of intrusive border management uh, strategies, which are taking place uh, actually. Um, today in, uh, in countries like Niger and Chad. Um, a progressive convergence between anti-terrorist strategies uh, and migration management strategies is what has, um, has become somehow evident. 
This has produced a pathologized gray area in which most of the times jobless youth, youth uh, has fitted in. And uh, as uh, the Emir of Kano yesterday was telling us, um, in the future, uh, Africa will have, uh, Ni Nigeria, he was talking about Nigeria, of course, Nigeria will have some, something like 80 million people aged uh, between 20 and 50 years old. And so uh, I think this, uh, this, this should matter. Um, uh, the pressures from, uh, from um, the pressure from uh, international donor community and uh, international organizations such as uh, the European Union and uh, and uh, the Organization for International Migration has brought on to the adoption of a common African Union juridical frame with the, with regard to terrorism. Um, a regional protocol have, have been formed on the basis for. Uh, uh, no, uh, regional protocol has formed the basis for, uh, for laws that, that have been adopted locally by states like Niger and Chad. Mm, uh, the problems of internal laws uh, which, uh, which have received the, the African Union juridical frame is that uh, uh, in countries like uh, Chad, Niger and Cameroon, is that, uh, uh, is that of the definition of the concept of security and terrorism, uh, that of the sanctions which are, com which are uh, imposed to, to the guilty persons and uh, the competence of, um, of the Kurds. Since in countries like, uh, in, a, in a country like Cameroon, it's the military Kurds which are, which are in charge of uh, judging. But uh, behind this, uh, these problems lies um, a clear political will to leave uh, the concept of security in a relative vagueness so that at the juridical level and, um, and uh, most of all and at the political level this can be uh, employed for uh, tactical political reasons that is for the next election. Um, this vagueness has allowed the Sahelian government, uh, like uh, Chad and Niger, and, uh, and in a lesser way in Nigeria, to find out comfortable ways to weaken political opposition and impose greater political control on their constituencies. Uh, the security narrative spoke of emotions and uh, produced a moral divide between uh, um, the perpetrators of uh, of, of evil acts and uh, and uh, a good citizens uh, and good citizens which do not uh, uh, dirt their hands with uh, with this stuff, but uh, this binary distinction has further divided citizens and polarized discussion about the role of the army and of political leaders in the, in uh, in African politics. The employment of the concept of security by states in the lecture basin brutally translates in a fierce social control. And this is most of all true for the case of Chad, uh, that is the one that I know better. Uh, the vagueness of the concept of security and terrorism has led to the progressive criminalization of mostly marginal social groups that were already marginal. And uh, uh, the, the vagueness, uh, no, uh, civil society and possibilities of civil engagement are therefore thwarted due to this, uh, to this behavior, let's say. NGOs and civil society have already denounced the liberticide action taking place in countries like Chad, Niger, and Cameroon, but still nothing has come over. Anti-terrorism and migration ma management strategies um, seem to be developed in the frame of a pervasive monetized patronage. Um, since many Sahelian states, since many Sahelian states are characterized for being low and middle income countries, inherently incapable to produce or market agricultural or manufactured products at a scale in an international competitive manner, Profits are mm, seldom obtained through direct or indirect rents. We all know this since, okay, already. Um, we all know this since uh, yesterday, the Emir was talking about the case of uh, Nigeria that, is, that mainly relies on the exports of crude oil. 
this mechanism has allowed uh, these countries to be integrated in the emergent global patronage order. Uh, on the top of one uh, clearly lies the United States and the Africa and European Union. But on the internal level, these profits have allowed the leaders in charge of securing their political future, extending their grip on civil society and increasing control over formally independent institutions, such as tribunals and courts, and, uh, and being able to adequately price the loyalty of its political elite and ensure their allegiance or cooperation. Uh, and since many Syrian states benefit from natural resources generated profits, this mechanism of the rents uh, has soon been extended to rents derived from military and military connected services. That is what is going on on border patrols on uh, um, a community which is called in uh, the G Sang Sahel. And, uh, and in many other ways, I can mention the Operation Flintlock uh, taking place each year uh, in a different Sahelian country, um, which, which, uh, uh, which takes place with uh, American or European instructors uh, and, uh, and so on. So, coming to the conclusions, my question is, since we are talking uh, wh whether, whether Africa can claim uh, uh, a future for the 21st century and which one, which future, I wonder uh, if this dynamic which, we, which I described um, is underpinned by a long-term political strategy or uh, is this dynamic another ch chapter in the history of the Washington Consensus framed projects that since the 1980s have been taking place in places like Sahelian states? And moreover, where is this path leading? And um, can Africa or Sahel uh, in the specific uh, claim the 21st century without attempting to reneg renegotiate power relations with the West regarding themes uh, like uh, mobility and security, which are themes, uh, I think, that uh, through which they can, uh, they, they, which can be used as a lever uh, from them. And uh, yes, I conclude here, and uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Alicia. I mean, it's um, very, very interesting. You see, I mean, when you started, I just want to make a comment here in relation to some of these dynamics you mentioned um, in relation to perhaps maybe whether African countries can really negotiate this dynamic, uh, the contention between what the state should do and the international community. I remember when I was the UN independent expert for the Sudan, you know, Sudan also was going through crises. You mentioned the IDPs. Um, Sudan had so many IDP camps, and you find out that one significant thing we found out was that people who were displaced were trapped in the IDP camps. They, a lot of the time they were not prepared to go back, and the IDP, camp, IDP camps were really very, very bad. But the international community, uh, the UNDP, everyone thought that, well, the only way to solve this problem were the IDP camps. Sudan then decided to come up with a plan, indicating that, look, these IDP camps were really creating problems rather than solving problems. They have problems, but the IDP camps were making them much more complex. So they now indicate, decided that they were not going to set up any new IDP camps. What they thought was that well, anybody who was displaced, they, were, they, went to, they were, were trying to use African solutions to African problems. There's anybody who was displaced from a war-torn area, when they move out, they are not going to IDP camps. They were going to use the African cultural, traditional, I mean, uh, neighborhood system. The families, they will move into families in other cities, live with other families, rather than going into IDP camps. You know, initially the UNDP did not like it. They said, no, you can't do that. But eventually they insisted, and it worked very well. You know, so perhaps, I mean, there are ways by which, I mean, uh, there are a lot of ways by which African countries can renegotiate this dynamic as we mentioned. I will be discussing I mean, some of them during question time. So we now move on again to Jane. Jane will be looking at African futurism. This relates to what I mean, Miriam presented earlier. I mean, uh, and uh, perhaps maybe Jane will be looking at it from a different perspective and taking the discussion on Jane. Yeah, thank you. I don't have any 
Okay. Well, I wish I could just speak off the cuff. I always admire people who can do that, but I have to have something in front of me because otherwise the words all fly away. So I'm going to read this um, short presentation. Uh, I became interested in what I'm calling African futurism when I started reading recent novels by writers like the South African Lauren Bukas and the Nigerian-American Nadia Okorafor, novels which would be categorized as speculative fiction. And they led me to ask whether science fiction and speculative fiction were really something new in African literature or whether they had a history that I was unaware of. I discovered that, for example, in South Africa, the Science Fiction Society of South Africa had been in existence since 1969, while the editor of the US-based genre journal Paradoxa, which devoted its 25th issue to African science fiction, traces science fiction in Africa back to early 20th century novels by white South African writers and forwards through writers like Kojo Lang, Ben Okri, Sonny Labutansi, Ngugi Wathiongo, to Waberi, Bukas, and Okorafor, taking in Kurtzia and Marachera along the way. And Sylvester Onwardi, the son of Buccia Machetta, who's here at the conference, reminded me early of, earlier of Bucci's novel, The Rape of Shavi, which is clearly speculative fiction and was published in the 80s. So it seemed, in other words, that we'd been reading African speculative fiction all along without knowing it. And what characterizes it, according to Zimbabwean writer Ivor Hartman, is that most speculative fiction, be it fantasy, sci-fi, or horror, is firmly rooted in cultural mythologies, through which, he says, African writers are already changing the face of literature and beyond. <clears throat> the term sci-fi, however, has been a problematic one, as many writers have found, with publishers informing them that black people don't read sci-fi, or dismissing elements of African spiritual belief systems as ghost stories or superstition. This issue has been discussed under the rubric of Afrofuturism, the mainly diasporic term from which I derive my own term, African futurism. Kodwo Eshul, for example, theorizes that while the practice of counter-memory as an ethical commitment to history, the dead and the forgotten, has traditionally relegated futurism to the sidelines of black creativity, this has been progressively challenged by contemporary African artists for whom understanding and intervening in the production and distribution of this dimension constitutes a chronopolitical act. So a lot of long words, but what he's essentially saying is that um, the, I think, referring to the earlier generation of post-colonial um, writing as being um, concerned with nation building and with reconstituting history, and that this is giving way now to writing which is more concerned with imagining the future. For Eschon, Afro-diasporic subjects live the estrangement that science fiction writers envision. Black existence and science fiction are one and the same. We can therefore see spe speculative fiction as a chronopolitical act with its roots in African modes of storytelling that draw on myth, orality, and indigenous belief systems. These lend themselves to the invention of personal mythologies, the writing of history in the light of future realities, and the use of extra-realist or magical phenomena as part of the everyday. Since these elements characterize many novels not thought of as speculative, this suggests that futurism has been a strain in African writing from its inception. So two points emerge. The 21st century has seen a turn from mythic revisioning to speculative fiction as a distinct and recognizable genre, notably by women writers such as Nedi Okorafor and Lauren Bukas, in whose work gender and femininity is a determinant in the projection of imagined futures. But more widely, we can see how speculative narrative strategies in a range of texts are brought to bear on specific historical situations on the African continent. For example, genocide, civil war, cross-continental migration, urban dereliction, xenophobia, violence, the occult, and the potential futures to which they point. We can conclude that such narratives, rather than being relegated to the category of fantasy, deserve attention as key indicators of futuristic thinking. The Cameroonian filmmaker Jean-Pierre Beccolo certainly thinks so, and he invented the term applied fiction 
to convey what he attempts to do in his film Les Saignantes, in English, The Bloodettes, which was hailed in 2005 when it came out as one of the first science fiction films to come out of Africa. He said, if technology has been a medium of our utopias, won't it be the role of the filmmaker to invent with fiction the reality that we will live in tomorrow? Applied fiction will be that new science we need to master so that machines don't take over our existence. Applied fiction as a space for tomorrow's activism and citizenship. By this, Beccolo implies that the futurist, futurist text itself does the work of interpreting the world in order to change it through invention and forward projection. <clears throat> One of the ways it does this is by unsettling generic conventions. In the film, old-fashioned intertitles periodically appear that highlight the difficulty of staying within conventional boundaries. These intertitles ask, how can you make an anticipation film in a country that has no future? How can you make a horror film in a, in a place where death is a party? How can you make an action film in a country where acting is subversive? How can you film a love story in a society where love is impossible? How can you make a crime film in a country where investigation is forbidden? How can you watch a film like this and do nothing after? The generic instability of the film, a stylized sci-fi action horror hybrid, is therefore a response to and a comment on the systemic political and economic dysfunctionality of a particular country at a particular time. But it also acknowledges a crisis of representation in the face of extremes that defy a realist approach. For Beccolo, critiquing the present must give way to inventing the future. He says, each time one speaks of Africa, it's in the context of the past or the present, never the future. But that future will arrive, above all for the young, and what we'll do with it then will be what we'll have, what we'll have thought of today. This generic instability can be seen in numerous texts we don't think of as sci-fi, often characterized by the refusal of the dead to remain within bounds and at a distance from the living. Examples are Veronique Tadjo's account of her visit to Rwanda after the genocide in Imana, where the dead persist in tormenting the living, as well as Sonny Laboutansi's Life and a Half, in which a grotesque dictator's desire for absolute power is constantly frustrated and undermined by the refusal of those he kills to die. A speculative technique in a number of novels is a simultaneous defamiliarization and invocation of an actual place. For Tansi, it's the Congo of the Mobutu era. era. In Ngugi's Devil on the Cross and Wizard of the Crow, it's Moise Kenya. In Patrice Nganang's Dog Days and Jean-Pierre Beccolo's film Les Seignantes, it's Paul Bia's Car Cameroon. In Dambuzo Marichera's Black Sunlight, it's Mugabe's Zimbabwe, and so on. Through such mythical devices, Tadjo, Tansi, and the others, satirize and destabilize patriarchal power. Often, destructive feminine archetypes like Sonny Labutansi's Chaidana and the Bloodettes in Beccolo's film, who embody desirable and deadly femininity, magically intervene in social reality by seducing and murdering corrupt and powerful men. As Matthew Omelsky puts it in Beccolo's work, women are the radical cyborgian subjects who undermine organic notions of femininity, the female body, and masculinist power structures. In Kahiu Wanuri's 2009 film, Pumzi, the future is ruled by a matriarchate that appears to the heroine, Asha, in the form of a hologram and dictates her every move. In this film, the hybridity and ambivalence of many futurist texts is seen in the extreme use of technology for authoritarian control including the surveillance of dreams, counterpoised by Asher's subversive dream of a tree growing in the desert where nothing has grown since the great water wars that have devastated the earth. Escaping from the controlled world of the interior, Asher uses precious drops of liquid from her own body to nurture a magical seed that has somehow survived. Here, rationality and science are contested by dreams, and this recourse to a spiritual dimension points in turn to alternative realities. So I'm wrapping up now, Mashoud. <laughs> These then are examples of chronopolitical interventions by which writers and filmmakers draw on indigenous modes of spiritual apprehension 
to create a fantasy of an alternative future. Tadjo does this in her representation of trauma resulting from the genocide in Rwanda, the grotesqueries of dictators in novels by Tanzi, Ngugi, and Nganan are magnified to cartoon-like effect, projecting a world in which obscene power has become embodied and immortal. These novels, then, can be seen as urtexts of speculative rewriting, invoking orality and myth to defamiliarize and challenge the assimilation of violence into the everyday, rewriting the script of vengeance based on false modes of memorialization Tadjo also points the way to a transformation of consciousness and subjecthood. If the dead in Imana, or dogs in Nganang's dog days, or aliens in Neil Blomkamp's film District 9, are subjects who have rights and express their desires, the concept of the human is radically altered. In exploring this alteration, speculative fiction novels and films challenge us to reassess the boundaries of our own subjectivity. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jane. I mean, this subject of futurism really intrigues me. Well, I similar to when I was listening to Miriam. But one thing is, I mean, we keep on, I mean, this challenges the argument that perhaps maybe uh, this concept is not known in traditional uh, uh, Africa. Uh, but we have been referring, I mean, and I do understand, to a lot of English uh, uh, literature to prove this. I mean, some of us who are from Nigeria here, who are Yorubas, I mean, I remember in our primary school days, there was a book written very long ago in Yoruba. It is called Ogbojo Odeni Nugbo Dumari. And the meaning of that is, you know, the extraordinary hunter in the extraordinary forest. You know, I mean, it's, I mean if you look at it, it's, it's, it was, it's so intriguing. This extraordinary hunter's hand turned into different weapons, I mean, which could really, and in those days, and it really registered in the mind of youths. You know, when, but perhaps maybe one's understanding then was very different from what one is picking up now. You find out that even primary school students then, when they find themselves in difficult situations, they refer to themselves as the extraordinary hunter, you know, in the extraordinary forest, you know, that their hands can turn into something in order to, so I believe even in local languages, even in local languages, you can find material, literature, written not in English, but written in local languages that perhaps one could argue uh, relates to uh, the concept of science uh, uh, fiction also in that regard. We'll have more to discuss on that uh, uh, later. Now, coming to language, again, I want to call on my colleague, Aishege uh, Githura, who preceded me actually at one time as the chair of Center of African Studies who will be looking at the connection between language, linguistics, and governance. Chege. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mashoud. Um, that was a very <coughs> apt uh, start for my presentation because I'm going to talk about the importance of African languages. And it's remarkable how, I'm not sure about how old you are, but, but uh, many years ago you were told about this story which stuck in your mind in Yoruba, and it has continued in your life to this day. And I think this is one of the points I'm going to highlight in my talk about the importance of African languages in reclaiming the 21st century. So it is a very simple thesis that uh, knowledge begins where one is located, and that language is an import, in, indispensable tool for accessing knowledge. Language is also a human right because it is also the chief medium of instruction in all types of formal and informal education and subsequent access to legal justice and knowledge. It is also the chief medium for the preservation, practice, and cultivation of culture. In my view, African languages have been undermined and their natural growth is stifled. And this disruption of the development stretches back to the slave trade that oversaw the massive transfer of African peoples and knowledge and the erasure of the languages through forceful means and structures of domination. Colonialism generated further contexts for the disempowerment of Africans, Latin Americans, and some Asians, upon whom the languages of conquering European languages were imposed in all areas of higher learning and literary expression. Ex-colonial languages continue to dominate all prestigious domains such as education, 
science, big business and laws, parliament, good jobs, etc. They are therefore the languages of power whose deployment often serves to establish formality and social distance between the interlocutors. To me, this is one of the greatest challenges for Africa and how language has created new divisions based on language and social economics. Now, the asymmetric relationship existing between African and ex-colonial languages is reflected by the roles and the functions taken up by individuals when selecting to use either language in specific contexts. In the current language situation, African languages lack prestige in the face of dominant European languages, which are the vehicles of upward social mobility. The exclusive use of English or French or Portuguese in all but basic education in practically all African countries uh, creates a negative context for African languages, which further undermines an already poor culture, for example, of reading and writing in them. The chief result of all this is acculturation at very many levels, social, political organization, dietary habits, dress, and of course, uh, language. Now, all this, in my view, or rather furthermore, with exceptions, with few exceptions, education systems have no place for African languages in tertiary and higher education. All this contributes, in my view, to what I call a psychic disbelief in the potentiality and abilities of African languages. That we distrust our languages in their capacity to articulate higher knowledge, science, and technology. As one responded, declared to me, well, why bother teach my children in Kikuyu if there are no computers that speak in Kikuyu or that are programmed in Kikuyu? Furthermore, African languages are generally taught for the purposes of basic literacy for native speakers and equally basic communication for non-natives. Now, this applies not only in adult literary classes, but also in some universities outside of Africa where languages, African languages are taught. And the underlying assumption in all these cases is that the African languages will only serve basic purposes such as letter writing, basic accounting, and for entry into field research about other topics in the case of some Western scholars. Ultimately, it is expected that all parties will revert to a European or other foreign language for any higher purposes, uh, as a, such as writing dissertations or books about Africa. Now, in another extreme situation, such expectations are actually further used to justify uh, aspects of la to the simplification of aspects of, la of African languages, such as, for example, the absence of tone marking in many of the languages, which have tones but are not actually marked because, well, that can be dispensed with. It's not too important. Orthographies that impede, omit, or fail to be embraced by speakers, all of these add to what I have referred to as a disbelief in the ability of our African languages. Now, because I was asked to talk about linguistics, language, linguistics, and governance, let me say briefly something about linguistics. So the scientific study of language, otherwise known as linguistics, is important to development and governance in Africa, I believe. A mere fraction of Africa's 2,000 plus languages are described in any meaningful way today in form of published or accepted grammars, dictionaries, or even orthographies. A number of languages are endangered as well, requiring trained field workers to record, document, and preserve them. Descriptive studies provide policymakers with the data required to make useful decisions related to language planning or educational policy. And I will cite a few examples of what I think are uh, relevant uh, examples of linguistic studies that have been applied to policy to various degrees of success. One of them being actually a 1970s study on language in society in East Africa by former source lecturer Wilfred Whiteley. Um, uh, where, um, which uh, provided a massive, uh, well, a very widespread study of uh, the uses of language socially in not just uh, in East Africa, including Ethiopia, uh, Tanzania, Kenya, and Uganda. Now, some of the results of this work were very useful, although uh, uh, not only to the Kenya government, but also to bodies such as the UNESCO, who had in the first place commissioned this, uh, this study. There is also the rigorous but little known work of Brandt and Molich in 1980, who also went around uh, Kenya and uh, other parts of East Africa 
documenting the usage of languages, numbers of speakers, who speaks languages, and so who speaks like what languages, where and when. Very useful data, which uh, I will come back to that uh, a bit later. Uh, the ACALAN, the, uh, the, uh, uh, an organization that is dedicated to African, the study of African languages and based in South Africa, as well as various other academic bodies, uh, continue to work on research and advocacy. Linguists were very much involved in the Kenya Constitution Review, which now gives uh, constitutional protection to Swahili as a national and official language, and which also guarantees the place of all indigenous and minority languages. Now we can go back to earlier times in the 19th century where linguists were wittingly or unwittingly instrumental in the scramble for Africa. The classification of languages, for example, was used as a basis for many colonial policies, not least apartheid. Wilhelm Blake, for example, is best known for coining the term Bantu in about 1857, having noted the indisputable unity of a, number, a vast number of, of languages covering East and Southern Africa. Bleak had in fact attempted to prove a North African origin of the Hottentot, what we call the Khoisan languages today, uh, in his PhD dissertation. Of course, he proved himself wrong. Um, in about 1855, uh, sorry, um, before, um, he published his work in the language of Mozambique in 1856, and in the following year, he was appointed interpreter to the British governor of Cape Colony. Now, Bleak introduced the term Bantu to cover this macro family of African languages, which is a very correct term, and uh, very up, linguistically speaking, it is a, a, a very apt coinage. Um, now, one little, uh, uh, one little note that uh, uh, one comes across uh, uh, in, a, in another publication by one of his uh, st students and followers, Doke, in 1961, he had prepared a little manuscript in which he published which was published nearly a century later under the title Zulu Legends in 1952. Now, he had written it in 1857, um, in which he wrote, and I quote, the word abantu, which means men or people in, in his intelligence, means par excellence individuals of the Kaffir race, particularly in opposition to the noun abelungu, which means white men. Now, it appears, therefore, to be the best general term for the family of languages. That's fine. Now, this manuscript was published just four years after the formal establishment of apartheid, a race-based political system implemented by the minority white South African rulers. And in my interpretation, such a statement by an eminent linguist could have served the apartheid regime very, very well in justifying a separation of races based on an opposition between Abantu and the Abelungu. Indeed, the apartheid state went further in racializing the term Bantu, whose use remains contentious long after the end of apartheid. Another good example is during of the 20th century is the Phelps Talks Commission, which was set in 1920 to investigate the education needs of African people. Again, this commission went not just to East Africa, they started actually out in West Africa and Nigeria, they went to Central Africa, Southern Africa, and in 1926, they compiled their report about the East African situation on language. This report, commissioned by this philanthropic American, was very instrumental in determining the language policy of Kenya and the other nations which were under the British colonial rule. So I'm just giving these examples to highlight what, how important linguistic research is. And I cannot fail also, of course, to uh, mention that um, there are many other projects going on. Uh, some of the, uh, the work happening here, at, right here at SOAS, the work of Ulrike, for example, in understanding multilingualism, the study of further study of Bantu parameters, for example, by Lutz Martin. All these works, hopefully, they will also contribute to some kind of policy making decisions in the future. Now, so as I said, um, the, the systematic understanding of languages is really, really important. Now, in my understanding, um, the one of other key challenge, um, in addition to breaking this psychic disbelief in our own languages, is the challenge of multilingualism and emerging languages in Africa. And this is directly linked to urbanism. Now, one fact that has not been mentioned much in this conference is the speed and rate at which Africa is urbanizing. There are certain state, uh, city, uh, countries now where up to 40 or 50% of the population has become urbanized. And this is generating, again, new contexts, 
especially for language, and this is producing new languages which we must contend with in the very near future. So, and one example is uh, Sheng, which uh, has been mentioned before and on which I have been uh, researching on for quite a few years. Now, this, uh, uh, this particular uh, uh, code marks, an addition to a new, marks the addition of a new variety of Swahili to the Kenyan repertoire of languages. It is adding to the complexity of the social stratification that exists in Kenya today. Now, what is of interest here to everybody, economics, economists, not just linguists, is this link between language and social economic class. And I cannot emphasize that uh, uh, enough. Um, what are the implications of all this? That um, we have to deal with uh, uh, um, such uh, new, uh, uh, new emergencies in an effective way in the, in the, in the coming century. So what's to be done in the, in the 21st century? Well, reality is defined as something that, we can, that cannot be wished away. Multilingualism is a reality in Africa, and it cannot be wished away, nor can it be eradicated by the stroke of a pen, outlawing many languages and institutionalizing one as the official language. These emerging and mixed languages, full of global influences and transnational influences of global black culture and other cultures, must be taken into account and given the democratic space that they merit. The same with Creole languages and others that have de developed out of different parts of Africa. And therefore, the challenge of the 20th century, in my view, is to turn the vision that desires, of, uh, all these desires that we have about the prosperity of Africa, about the development of Africa, reconstruct it in our languages. I think if we don't do that, we will have accomplished part in part what we intend, we want to do. And of course, Translation comes in quite importantly here. I notice that in Kenya today, many, many Kenyans, and in Tanzania, of course, they enjoy lots of Nigerian uh, 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 movies. Yeah? Lots, very, yeah. And many of those movies are not in English. They are in Hausa or Yoruba. These are some of the most popular ones. Well, through translation, subtitling, you know, dubbing, etc., Kenyans are enjoying the reality of Nigeria with very little encumbrances. Not only can they relate to what they see on the film, but they can also fill in the gaps that they have in language. And therefore, I don't think multiplicity of languages is necessarily a barrier to enjoying our cultures and also uh, taking them in other parts of the, uh, of the continent. There's so much more to talk about. It's about language, remember? So I will stop there, and uh, thank you very much for listening to me. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much, I mean, Chege. Um, I, I cannot also help by chipping in some um, illustrations again here. You know, <laughs> uh, when Chege was talking about the issue of, I mean, disbelief in African languages, I mean, I can talk about the Nigerian community because that's where I'm from. In Nigeria, actually, I mean, we do take pride. If you, go, if you visit a Nigerian family and they have children who, even in primary school, nursery school, if you speak to the children in the native language, the parents will be annoyed. They say, don't spoil their English. They are annoyed. They don't want to spoil, don't talk to them in local. Now in the UK here, there are many Nigerian families, I mean, with children who do not understand the local language at all. So losing both ways. Now coming to illustration, I used to use this illustration for my law students. In the law courts in Nigeria, when we used to practice, English is the official language. And a lot, we used to make a joke about certain things that happens in court. Sometimes in court, you find out that the judge is a local, he's a Yoruba. Both the litigants are also Yoruba. They understand one another. The judge understands what they are saying. But the official language of the court is English. He has to record everything in English. But the litigants don't speak English. Even though the judge understands them, there has to be an interpreter. So when the, the lawyers speak in English, so the lawyers will have to speak in English, and the interpreter will then, when the evidence is being given, the translator will interpret. Sometimes the translator does a poor job. The judge knows when the translator interprets, do, do you think you understood what he said? I mean, so the judge will ask, ask the interpreter, 
are you sure you understood what he said? That's because he cannot write, he understood the judge hears what, but he cannot write. Because the litigant is using a language which is not a language of the court. So sometimes, and when we talk about language and governance and development, sometimes it can uh, stop a um, uh, um, uh, process. Because if the interpreter is not good enough, the judge will have to rise, find, will tell the, find a better interpreter. Because he knows that interpreter, even though he, why does he not just go on straight? Because he understands the language. But because English is the language of the courts, and it's about, I mean, lacking confidence in the local languages. So perhaps, I mean, this also illustrates one of the problems. Now, uh, finally, I want to call on Andrew. Before I do that, I mean, everything we've been saying perhaps also need to be illustrated by practice. Andrew is a partner in Hudson uh, and Williams legal practice in the city. And we, they are partners with us in the law school. We do law and development in Africa. We have a course here called law and development in Africa. So we partner with, I mean, Hunting and Williams in relation to, they are actually our partners in this conference. Andrew has handled so many major international financing uh, and energy infrastructure uh, projects, advising governments in different parts of Africa. So many of the things we are theorizing about. So Andrew will perhaps maybe talk about how perhaps, I mean, effort is being made, actually also in practice, to improve a uh, development on the ground through collaboration with local partners. So, Andrew. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, um, and congratulations on making it to the last talk of this conference. And I don't see a single nodding head in the audience, so, so that's encouraging. Um, Mashoud is right. What, what I want to talk about is development in Africa and the way in which the language of law uh, affects and assists in that process. Um, I was slightly alarmed when Alice Nicole said that economists are arrogant and Mashoud said that the law can be boring. And I thought, well, that's, that sums up maybe the start of my, my speech. Um, one of the things I want to come on to is there is a lot of talk in Africa at the moment about public-private partnerships as a solution to um, a lot of the infrastructure problems that are in Africa at the moment. And this talk is designed to give a slightly critical view of that process. Uh, I use this slide a lot to um, show there was talk yesterday that rather than a dark continent, people wanted a bright continent. I think what this slide demonstrates is that what we also need is a light continent. Um, we can talk a lot about literature and art, but without light bulbs and lighting and power and heat, um, to some extent, they become secondary in people's lives. Um, Africa has an extraordinary infrastructure deficit. I mean, a couple of these figures are quite interesting in that sub-Saharan, so just sub-Saharan African countries with approximately 800 million people generate the same amount of power as Spain currently does. Um, in the transportation sector, the road density in Africa is only one third um, of Africans are within two kilometers of an all season road. Uh, water storage infrastructure uh, is incredibly um, inefficient and poor at the moment, and healthcare facilities are negligible. Um, we were recently looking at a healthcare facility in Nigeria and talking about bringing in new uh, forms of electromagnetic scanners 
to be told that whilst there were four in West Africa, not one of them was operational at the time of speaking. Um, the World Bank currently estimates that African nations, Af sub-Saharan Africa, will need approximately 35 billion US dollars a year to bridge this infrastructure gap. The grand solution that is talked about almost everywhere on the continent is PPPs, public-private partnerships. The idea of PPPs is to spread the risk between government and the local parties. Um, they are designed to cover most of the areas of shortfall in infrastructure in Africa at the moment. Um, I won't go through this slide today, but, but, but that basically is the sort of slide that we sometimes put up to scare people into why these things aren't as simple as they might seem. This is perhaps a better slide in encompassing exactly what these PPPs are meant to do. Uh, they're meant to provide transportation, social infrastructure and public utilities, all of which are fundamental um, shortfalls uh, in African economies as we speak. Why? Um, one thing that has been made incredibly clear is that there is a simple, inextricable link between development and productivity. Uh, we saw in Alice Nicole's slides how Africa is just lagging seriously behind uh, the rest of the world in terms of development. And one of the core features of this has to be the failure to implement efficient infrastructure. Uh, there was a, a figure that came out recently using sort of first world country um, statistics that Germany is now 20% more efficient than the UK. Um, you can look at re various reasons for that, but one of the major reasons is that the UK has failed to invest in its underlying transportation infrastructure in the way it should have done. It is extraordinary that you are looking at countries like the UK and saying they have insufficient infrastructure, then turning to African countries and saying, well, if the system in the UK isn't producing the productivity that we need, what chance do the African countries have at present with their transportation systems? Um, Without creating this infrastructure, you don't create jobs. Without jobs, you don't create productivity, and without productivity, you don't create jobs, and you end up in a vicious cycle whereby you create poverty. Um, we all heard the tales and the statistics of people earning less than a dollar a day uh, in West Africa yesterday. One of the things that's interesting when you talk about infrastructure is the connectivity of the various shortfalls. Um, we put up not possibly the best um, road that I could find, but the idea of this was to make the point that it's all very well building roads, but equally, if you don't have a safe and decent um, bus system, at the moment, if you go to Lagos or any of the mega cities in Africa, you have unregulated, poorly put together buses, let alone having roads on which they can operate. This then, I want to come on to the more controversial part of the talk, which is about what is wrong with PPP. And what strikes me above anything else is that these are first world constructs and systems that are being imposed upon African countries. And I think there is a huge danger in a almost po post-colonial arrogance in the way that structures that may well work for first world countries are being imposed upon third world emerging market countries that are perceived to be ready for these structures. I would argue very strongly that they're not yet ready for that. This, it's very difficult to see, is a um, request for proposals which was put up by the Lagos state government for a new hospital in Lagos. What this effectively says is, we want a new hospital, you will do it using a public-private partnership, and that's great. 
It doesn't say how, how much, when, why, what cost, how much profit, when it'll be completed, how long it will last for. It simply, in effect, is a big page contract that says, we just want someone else to solve our infrastructure problems because we have been told that PPP is the answer to everything. We then come on to capital structures of projects and to talk very quickly about this, every single one of you will know somebody who is developing a power station, a road, a business, a project, um, something in an African country. All of these require two effective bits to their capital structure, i.e. how you're actually going to pay for them, one of which is the debt and one of which is the equity. Almost every single project that I see that comes across my desk has no equity. And people come to you and say, well, we want to build this power project. I think at the last count, the Ghanaian um, request for proposals for power projects had 64 um, current um, proposed projects, way too many. Uh, very few of them have the equity that are required. Most of them are not viable. Um, these things are not being addressed properly. Um, this is just using a large hydro project that we were involved with that shows the size of the amount of equity that you need. This one needed 174 million. Uh, it was an early and very large project and therefore it had a very good international sponsor. It also got a lot of the IFIs behind it who were prepared to assist. One of the potential solutions for this is the sovereign wealth funds. Uh, Africa has finally started to invest in its own sovereign wealth funds. Nigeria, about two or three years ago, started its own NSIA. And what I am very, very hopeful for is that these entities will start to plug some of this equity gap. Um, time frames. These projects take a very long time. As somebody pointed out to me, most African politicians will not commission projects if they don't think they're going to get to cut the ribbon in front of their electorate. Um, most of these infrastructure projects you're talking about years, if not tens of years, in their completion. Exchange rate risk, very quickly. Most of these projects will ultimately be funded in US dollars. We've seen the effect of oil price hits on exchange rates in African countries. Uh, the Naira is a good example, despite attempts to, to, to hold it to a pegged level. Um, bonds are often now suggested as a means of financing um, capital expenditure, but I think in brief what I wanted to conclude with is that where I think things are going astray in Africa at the moment is that the middle ground for infrastructure is being highly populated and the micro projects and the massive projects are being overlooked. I think unfortunately whether we like it or not it will have to be large state projects which are the way forward. Um, or very small minibus type projects at the other end. So it's not an entirely um, a happy way to conclude this talk, but I think that it is designed to say that we have a huge need to fix infrastructure problems in Africa at the moment. And I think to some degree, to um, paraphrase what His Royal Highness, the Emir of Kanu, was saying yesterday, is it something that needs to be done within each African country? It is not clear to me that external help is any more helpful than aid has been over the last 30, 40 years, and that an element of prioritization needs to be done because at the end of the day, you can't do everything immediately. You have to pick. So thank you very much.
when I, uh, we introduced the panel, I indicated in the report of, I mean, the World Bank on uh, whether Africa can claim the 21st century, they argued the fact that, well, um, uh, partnerships are essential. We have been talking about the issue of perhaps, I mean, Africa trying to solve its own problems. The AU now is pushing a lot the concept of African solutions for Africa, African problems. Now we've heard, uh, and um, I mean, the point usually is, usually uh, uh, the, the report also indicates that there should be less dependence on aid, you know, from, from, from the developed world. Now, less dependence on aid, partnerships, uh, then Africa solving its own, own, own problems. Now, the truth of the matter is sometimes when we talk about Africa solving its own problems, uh, a very nice article by, I mean, Bunsu Mensah from Ghana giving that, well, it's very good to say this. Africa solving its own problems in order to take, out, or take us out of the trap which we believe that the international community, perhaps maybe, or the developed world uh, puts us in. Bonsu then asks, Africa solving its own problem with African solutions. Where is the research? You know, that's just tied to say Africa solving, uh, African solutions for African problems. Where is the research? You know, and the argument he's raising is, well, it's good to say these things. And it's good to talk about the fact that, well, the numbers don't add up economically. I mean, the economic numbers, the data, big data, doesn't add up. I mean, Africans have to look at things by themselves. Chege, our own language. I mean, similarly, it's issue of security, international community, plotting against Africa. I mean, uh, similar to uh, Andrew's closing point, the fact that well, Africans have to look within. It, how, I mean, how do we identify this? Where is the African solution? We've just been talking about where is it? What is it? So perhaps maybe can, can, we, can, can we address this? What is it? What is the African solution? Where is it? How do we find it? I mean, I think one of the problems with the African solution is that as long as there is an alternative, we are always, all of us, human nature is that if there is an easy way of proceeding, an easy route, you take it. And at the moment, a lot of that is to look to the West and to look at developmental uh, institutions to try and find quick fixes, easy fixes, opportunities to use Western constructs to, to work on African um, projects. And I think one of the easiest fixes, unfortunately, is you just have to stop relying on those constructs and do it yourself. Um, necessity breeds invention. I, I agree about the research, but as long as there remains this ability to rely on somebody else, I, I'm not sure how quickly anybody will wish to do to put in the hard work. Okay, Shege. Yeah, just to add to that, yeah, I think um, one of the reasons that uh, uh, many Africans sometimes we look to the West is because a some of those problems we are trying to resolve were planted by the West. Uh, B uh, the structures that we've inherited, you know, including you know physical infrastructure, they actually. In fact, the blueprints are actually held in the West. And so there's no way actually you're going to resolve the, uh, the drainage system of a city like uh, Lisbon or, 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 or maybe Nairobi even uh, if you don't know where the, uh, the actual blueprint for those things are. And some of them are held in London or some other place. Yeah? So I think there is a, a bit of a necessity in looking to the West for some of these solutions. But I agree that we have to uh, enter a new paradigm. Now, the most radical solution would be to dismantle all that and start afresh. Then, therefore, we would have African solutions for African problems. That's interesting. I mean, I, I, Alice, I mean, when we are talking about, the, I mean, I, I know there is this book by, uh, you know, Martin Jevin. Yes. I mean, about, I mean, poor numbers. That is, you know, economy, he really, he's an economist himself, but he really critiques the fact that all these numbers that are made up by the World Bank, sometimes they make those numbers up. If you ask, he interviews he to find out what are the sources of these numbers. They, sometimes they make them up. Now, if that is the case, I mean, what would be the alternative? Do Africans have to really provide their own data in relation to this, or, I mean, economically, how, how do we solve this? Uh, 
Uh, yes, thank you. I just wanted to address the first question before yeah. Morten, uh, okay. of course, issue. Just to confirm what you what you were saying, I think that we should absolutely insist on the fact that aid is. I mean, it's not politically correct, but it is something very detrimental, you know, because it creates per se an asymmetric relationship. And this asymmetry is really per se as, as, as long as uh, you need uh, uh, something else or somebody else or whatever, because if we are in an asymmetric relationship by definition, this is uh, the donor, which is not at all a donor, but most usually a lender, as you really highlighted. I mean, it comes with conditions. I mean, if you borrow for your apartment or whatever, there are conditions, and conditions, what do they do? They restrict your policy space. So just to address the first question, it is extremely serious to find, and of course, you have a ideological discourse in development economics, which is coming with aid, saying uh, right from the beginning, right from the Second World War with the founding father of development economics, the famous two-gap deficit model was just for justifying with apparently scientific uh, issues that you have a gap in saving and whatever. Okay, aid will be beneficial, and we have really to rethink this. Second, your question on numbers. I left aside Morten Gervain issues be because it's an issue per se. I just wanted to highlight the issue of divergence. And I think that uh, it's, it's something a bit different from the quality of numbers. The quality of numbers is a disaster. We can make a political economy of statistics in Africa. Some people in France work with Martin Gervain and another group at Sciences Po on the political economy of numbers, yes. how numbers are built, which is really uh, could be a next workshop, I think, because it's really something absolutely crucial and which should be appropriated by precisely uh, uh, African, and I completely agree. Uh, my point was just to say that even if numbers are completely crooked, uh, fake, uh, whatever, there is a trend, and this trend is, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, not, it's a bit worrying, and we should, uh, but it is absolutely clear that uh, African statistician, and it is my last point, should absolutely take extremely seriously the issue of construction of number. And I insist it is the same issue as aid, because statistical department in Africa, how are they financed? By aid, by external consultant paid exactly 10 times at least as a local statistician, as you know, and the conditionality is, I mean, they want to make a survey in whatever country, they have to beg for any uh, uh, oil ticket or four-wheel drive car or whatever, everything is financed by aid. What is the autonomy of African statistician in this regard for census? Nigeria is a very good example That's right. of that. Thank you very much. Um, Alessio, your issue of security, how do we do it better? <laughs> and an African solution? Well, um, I think we should not talk about African solutions because I think it's a way to, um, to, to, to leave the continent alone. Uh, I think that unavoidably we are entrenched. The north and the south of the world is entrenched. We are a globalized world, we are a globalized economy. So there's no way to find African solutions which are not global solutions. And so rather than uh, talking about finding um, African or East Asian or Latin American solutions to each of the continent's problems, we should look at in, in a global manner to the, to the issues and, uh, and try to cooperate. And, um, and, and I think that nowadays um, there are some, some countries uh, in Africa, since we are talking about this, uh, which are finding their, uh, their own agency in uh, relating to uh, global partners or uh, global organizations and, uh, um, of the North, of course. And, um, but still lacks the, 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 the continental vision to, to channel this, uh, this agency and, uh, and, and talk uh, fairly about the issues like security and mobility and others uh, of the government. Again, How, what is the role of futurism in all this in relation to perhaps maybe uh, looking at things strictly from an African perspective? I'm a little bit upset by the idea that art and literature are secondary to light bulbs. Um, given that art and literature preceded light bulbs, you know, that uh, people were painting on walls of caves before they had electricity and storytelling and so on. Um, but what the example of science fiction in Africa shows, I think, is that African literature didn't have to wait for a label 
from outside to define what it was doing, that the, it looked inside for its own um, conceptual forms. And um, I suppose that this is where um, my presentation fits into the panel, if it fits in, because I feel that I'm speaking a very different language from the other members of the panel. I think it does. I mean, in relation to looking in what, as you rightly mentioned. Um, okay, I'm now uh, ready to defer to the audience now for questions. You have, I mean, about 20 minutes to take questions. Yes? Yeah. Mike, please. Yeah. Um, thank you to all the panelists for your interesting talks. Um, we have been, disc oh, this is just kind of a comment and maybe um, another topic of discussion, but we're discussing the issue of a kind of African solution to African problems. And I personally um, kind of agree with Alessio saying it's not necessary just to leave the continent alone, but I think there's already the infrastructure within Africa, um, banks like the African um, Ex Import Export Bank, the African Union, even just looking at some of the unions that the countries have themselves, ECOWAS, SADC, and just saying, is it not possible for us to look inwards and look to these um, institutions and saying, well, why are you not the providers of, um, if we reference Andrew's presentation of equity in some of these key projects, especially if they are projects that will link the countries within within their organizations themselves. So if we look at ECOWAS, if it's a project that will link um, you know, Nigeria to a country like Sierra Leone or in SADC, something that will link South Africa to Congo, why are these institutions not becoming more economic um, players in Africa and actually providing equity, providing support, instead of us looking outwards to the World Bank, to the IFC? So is that not a way that we can use African solutions to African problems? Thank you. Any other questions? The, okay, uh, Kenneth. <laughs> so we'll take about three questions yes. and then... Thank you very much. Um, first, the first presenter uh, was talking about um, the, uh, what is this, <laughs> the first topic? Uh, that was um, uh, the, the novelist ideas, I mean, futuristic ideas, of, of, of course. Yeah, I, 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 was, I was thinking that um, uh, there's no society that can live without fiction. And I'm Africans had fiction. Perhaps it was not just written. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to say that. But then um, the question that I have is on um, uh, the Africa debate, leaving it alone. We must differentiate between alone and aid. Okay. But the problem that we have currently, and that is pertaining, for example, in Zambia now, is that they want to borrow. But then we are told we have a political situation in the country, for example. At, at the moment, our main opposition leader is incarcerated. And so Zambia perhaps wants to borrow money. But IMF has certain conditions of good governance and the like. So there is a pull and push. The opposition is saying, don't give us the money because the government will not look after your money. Tenants of good governance are not being taken care of. Look at the incarceration. The government is saying, give us the money. If you don't give us the money, then you are telling us that, or, I mean, you, you are still ruling us. You are holding on to the money because you have certain, certain, certain conditions you have applied. So if you don't, if you don't want to, so, uh, to give us the money, then it means that uh, you, you are using the money to rule us. So colonialism is still continuing. So I am wondering, why do we attach what I put in inverted commas, bad conditions, conditions yeah. to borrowing as against aid? OK. Thank you. Conditions to. That's, yeah. Frederick, yeah. So we'll take those questions after three questions. So. I wanted to ask you a little bit about agency um, because what struck me in Chegis and Jane's presentations 
was that there is a lot of agency and there are visions expressed in literature and there is creativity and resilience in informal language use. And then we see, you know, we changed scene and then we see the institutional view, institutions, African institutions or global institutions um, that are built on a colonial model and that also dictate what the problem is. So I think it's very hypocritical to ask Africa to find solutions for a problem that it hasn't even defined itself or that the majority of Africans has not defined as a problem but a, a, a very <laughs> small elite has defined as a problem. Um, and so rather than reiterating that this is a problem, we know that this is a problem, right? I wanted to ask, especially Jane and Chegger, and I think, J uh, Jane, you have a very important place in this panel, to, to uh, think about places where this agency exists and how it could be used to talk back to these uh, excluding institutions. Thank you. So we have three questions. I mean, uh, anyone could go first? Who wants? Okay. Jane, you want to? Well, just in response to Friedrike, um, I'm thinking of examples of um, social media and the internet as tools for um, the distribution and creation of new platforms for literature in places as diverse as Nairobi and Cape Town with um, the journals Kwani and Chimaranga and the way they've been um, embraced by a whole new generation of writers who are creating networks and sharing work in ways which were never envisaged by the old-fashioned publishing houses, which of course were based in Europe anyway. And um, how uh, f literature festivals and um, workshops and all kinds of literary communities have grown up as a result of these. And this is a very um, material example of young Africans talking back to institutions, I think. Uh, no. Yeah, yeah, sorry, can I add to that? Yes, because I think uh, I fully agree with, the, with this line. Because I, <clears throat> um, the more I look at things in Africa, the more I think and believe that um, uh, um, the youth the young generation or the future, gen well, the current generation coming up, uh, actually might present more better solutions than we have. Now, part of the problem is the, 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 the ruling elite are neo-colonial ruling elites. And so they really can't understand things in any other way or do not wish to understand in any other way. And I think yesterday the Emir of Kano said it very well, that uh, in Africa there is a tendency, and everywhere else I suppose, there is a tendency to stare at solutions in the face and do nothing about it, and just you know look for another you know another direction. Okay, um, uh, uh, when the judge in Nigeria or Kenya, for that matter, in the example you gave a while ago, that the same same scenario, you will find in Kenya. Uh, the solution to making a good judicial uh, a good judgment and understanding this, the case is to actually listen to this man or woman in their language, but we all avoid that and we insist on using English, all right, whereas it is clear to everybody that the Yoruba or Swahili or Kikuyu or whatever is the one that should be done. So what I see now is that the younger people, and I'm talking about the 65% of Africa's population according to the United Nations Development Program, currently is under the age of 25. Now, these are the people who, in a sense, and linguistically, what I see is a sort of a rebellion, a rejection of the high standards, the high standard codes, such as standard Swahili, standard English, standard French, and so on and so forth. At the same time, there is a wish to use the African languages without the baggage that comes with our parents' generation of ethno-linguistic or ethnic biases and based on, on, uh, on earlier conceptualizations of, of the African country. So the solution, at least in the case of Sheng, it seems to me the younger people say, well, we need modernity and we still want to be African, okay? But we don't want that, those alien, alien things that our parents and the Westerners are imposing on us. We will create our own. 
And I'm hoping that this is a trend, okay, that um, <clears throat> the youth will demand more power eventually, and that they will be able to wrestle power from the current ruling elites. And I think it is happening to an extent, at least in Kenya. Again, I'm sorry for the bias because I am more of an observer. I, I observe a bit more Kenya, and I'm not. And as I, again, it has been said before, it is very difficult. And anybody who tries to talk about the whole of Africa as one, I mean, you have, it, it's very difficult. So allow me to <laughs> give more examples from Kenya and East Africa. Uh, but I can see that happening. And more importantly, these younger generation, because of their transnational and global links, and because of their savviness, and because of the internet, and because of the exposure to the world, and the, the, the less need to travel to the metropolis now as before. You don't have to come to London to, you know, to, to do the things, that, you know, many things. You know, there's the internet, there's the, there's the Skype, there is WhatsApp, there is everything going on. I think they stand a better chance, okay, of actually achieving this. And that's where I think Africa might have a, a solution. Now, if they do that, and then they manage to bring down the borders of Africa, then we are sorted. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think to answer the specific question about why aren't the specific African uh, financial institutions doing more, it's partially because they are somewhat paralyzed by the constructs that they have. They are all funded to a greater degree, not only by African countries, but also by international countries. They have put in place international standards which are then very difficult to comply with locally. Um, but I think I would echo what Chege just said, which is my point about African-derived solutions was not that the entire uh, result of those plans be African-derived. It's that these solutions have to come from within some of the plans that are then put in place to implement them and some of the money must come from outside and should come from outside, particularly from the countries that in many respects have caused a great deal of the mess that certain African countries now find themselves in. But I think the process has to come from within and I think specifically from the youth. I think one of the problems you find with the older generation is they say, well, Germany and France and the USA have trains that go like this and have power stations that produce this. That's not necessarily necessary or needed in these particular scenarios. And so I think what I'm saying is that the solutions must come from within, but then often will need implementation with the assistance from outside. Okay, Alice. Alice, go on. Yeah. Alessio. Alessio. <laughs> okay. So, um, answering to the to the question posed by um, the conditions for borrowing money and uh, and so on, uh, for me, um, as a political scientist, it's clear that uh, if the North has the money, then he has to preserve its um, uh, favored uh, position, and uh, and that's why it gives uh, conditions. Uh, the point is that uh, it's not a win-win solution. It's uh, there's the north that which wins every 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 time, every single time that uh, uh, because this is in every, every um, uh, project which is implemented is basically for the for the benefit of the north in this way. And uh, well, uh, there are studies and uh, research such as the one uh, which has been showed by uh, Alice Nicole, uh, which uh, showed that uh, uh, from one side we have to know that uh, there is the cumulative causation which causes underdevelopment and so on. And the clear solution uh, demonstrated by economists is that we need more state. But uh, the public policy. But more uh, yes, we need uh, more involvement by policymakers and uh, and. Uh, and uh, to, to, to envision some solution. But uh, somehow um, the, 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 the consensus is that we need also lesser state. And so this creates an imbalance uh, and we are kind of stuck <laughs> right now. Just, just, just to jump back in for a second, nobody should view these international aid 
institutions as charities. Um, as you rightly say, any debt that they provide come with conditions, and often onerous conditions and unrealistic conditions, and there are interest rates that are usually far higher than anyone could get in the West. So my view would be the answer to some degree is you just simply say, no, we don't want your money until you're prepared to offer it to us at reasonable terms. Yeah, no, no, and thank you very much because in fact, it is a, a kind of a summary. Uh, the, the big issue, what I wanted to, to, to say through the concept of cumulative causation is exactly what everybody said. That is, what is the issue? I mean, let's have a look on developmental state, China, Korea, etc. That is, to create wealth, you need firstly jobs. I mean, I mean, you cannot then you can have more than jobs make that you can increase productivity. I mean, you cannot have any productivity which is wealth, by the way, uh, without uh, jobs. If you have, let's say, thirty percent or fifty percent of youth which is unemployed, I mean, by definition, the creation of wealth is zero. Then more productivity and jobs create more wealth and. What does it mean? It creates savings. The saving rate in Africa is absolutely, I mean, extremely low compared to, for instance, Asia and so on. With savings, what do you do? You have investment. So, and in this case, you don't need the donors. I mean, if investment is produ produced through domestic uh, savings. Then if you have investment, you can, of course, invest uh, without PPP, external organization, and so on. But for this, you, what do you need? You need also a taxation system. If you don't have any performing taxation system, I mean, a state cannot uh, levy some money from the citizen who are above the subsistence level because you cannot take any taxation if people, uh, half of the population is at the one dollar per day, etc. So, and also, if, if, if uh, countries, usually African countries are about 15% of tax ratio compared to France, 50%, etc. Scandinavian country, 55%, and, and, and so on. So if you cannot tax anything, you cannot redistribute. If you cannot redistribute, you cannot create infrastructure. If you don't have infrastructure, you cannot tax, because by definition, you cannot uh, uh, collect revenue, let's say Niger, Mali, or whatever, if the cost of revenue collection is so high that it is not profitable to invest in civil servant and so on, or uh, cars, to uh, collect taxes. And this is why even the IMF has made plenty of interesting papers saying that it is not even profitable to tax, and so let's not even collect taxes because it is not profitable for any state to collect that. And this is why the infrastructure issue is so important. And then I, I conclude in how can you trigger the vi virtuous circle? The issue of cumulative causation is just to say, okay, if your resources are coming from commodities, that is the price of oil is 50 in June, uh, no, 150 in June, like in 2007 or um, uh, 2008, and then 50 in November, and what can you do? Even the, the, somebody coming from Harvard or Princeton or whatever, the best economist cannot manage this fluctuation in revenue. And I think this is, a, and then I, I conclude in saying that it was not state intervention in, in the sense of owning the economy. It is clear that nobody, and especially in Africa, can, a public policy is not necessarily owning the economy. It is just providing incentive and this is public policy for precisely increasing saving, productivity, making that, for instance, uh, investment can be in long-term infrastructure, which is education, uh, 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 health, and so on. That is for having jobs. And productive jobs, by definition, it has also to do with the public system of education. That is, I'm very sorry, but in Senegal, if you I had a colleague, if you produce only economists, this is people are completely useless, you know. <laughs> and so you can produce engineer, uh, accountant, and so on. That is people who can, uh, anyway, so this is. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I, I will take one more round before, we, before we, we, we depart. Here, in the middle here, the elegant uh, uh, lady here. Yes. Thank you. Yes. I, I have really come to learn, and I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here wondering, do I dare ask this question because if it hasn't, Shez, I think you asked, I think you, 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 you mentioned it, but I'm just gonna, I'm, 
I, I've just got to say it out loud and you can tell me, shut up, you don't know what you're talking about. Is it possible to affect transformation in Africa with the leadership who created, who created and who are perpetuating the problems that you're talking about? Okay, that's, that's a good one. Uh, okay, um, the gentleman behind me. Thank you. Thank you, panel. Very stimulating inputs. Um, but I've noticed as we're discussing the future of Africa, we're thinking it very much of it very much in the context of Africa's relationship with the the North, Africa's relationship with the the West, whichever term we choose to use. But I wonder, would you like to reflect on Africa's future in the context of its relationship with the East? given that China is now um, pursuing a very aggressive economic colonialist policy in Africa. Okay. What about the East? Thank, Thank you. you. Um, um, I have the mic, can I, can I speak? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you okay. very much. Okay, <laughs> sorry. That's power. <laughs> I have a very quick question to Jane. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your paper. Uh, there was a very interesting session on Afrofuturism in the morning. It's a shame that you, were, you weren't there. I was there. Uh, you I were there. there. Okay, yeah. great. So then I can contextualize the, my question even better. Um, you mentioned in passing that you had a different concept of African futurism, which was different from Af Afrofuturism, and you didn't explain that. I was wondering whether you could elaborate a little bit on that. Uh, I'm, I'm particularly interested um, in the connections between African futurism and two concepts. One concept is the concept of race, which seems to be very prominent, very important in the Afro-diasporic Afrofuturism. So some of the definitions of Afrofuturism are, for example, to put a black face on the, on the future, or somehow project a black future, or black-faced future. Uh, and the second concept I'm interested in is uh, Afropolitanism. So do you see any, any relationships between that concept and uh, African futurism? But basically I'm interested really in the differences between the Afro-diasporic and African futurism. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll just take one more and then we'll round it up. The gentleman here, sorry. Uh, and then we just round it up, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to mention one uh, aspect of Alice's uh, presentation which really struck me and I think I'd like to express an opinion on it and a question. The charts and the graphs which were presented were so clear in the disparities that you express that I wonder if you would agree that the only way of African producers and suppliers of all these resources to manage the value at which those resources are internationally um, valued and expressed is to make sure that the actual valuation is done from a context of actual control of those resources when they're exported. I just wonder if you would agree with that. Control. Yes, control. It's the issue of control. Get that. Okay. So thank you. Now to the panel. Let's start from uh, Jane. Okay. Then we come down this way. Yes. Well, shall I shall I address the question that was addressed? Yes, definitely. Yeah. And I mean, any question that you are convenient with. Yes, check them. Yeah. Um, the point about Afrofuturism versus African futurism. Um, I just felt I needed a label which um, was specific to the continent. Since Afrofuturism emerged out of a sort of diasporic aesthetic, and you're quite right to, to emphasize race in that, because I see race as being um, less prominent in African speculative fiction than um, specific material realities on the African continent. And I reeled off a list of them, you know, from, from genocide to um, the various other things I mentioned. And um, so African futurism is really just a sort of cognate 
of Afrofuturism. Um, and Afro Afropolitanism, um, again, I see that as something which really pertains to the diaspora. Um, although if you look at the movie Pumzi that I, that I talked about, um, the representation of the female figure in that film is quite clearly a sort of Afropolitan um, figuration. So there are crossovers. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yes. Um, I'll stay away from African futurism. Um, <laughs> but I think the two things I would talk about, one is I think Africa has already looked east and I think somewhat to its peril. I think it has not been an ideal um, experience and I think there have been economic colonial tendencies that have started to occur. There have been quite extreme bargains that have been put in place by Eastern nations for roads and power stations and mobile networks. So, so I think Africa has looked east and not necessarily found it the experience that they might have thought it might be, and certainly not a panacea. And then I think to very gently touch on the issue of the current political regimes in Africa, I think it's a question you could ask of any country right now. I think even in our own country, we've seen a huge groundswell from the youth against the older uh, incumbent political class. And I think that is just a tension between young and old that is centuries old and will continue. Thank you. Anything? Well, um, talking about the relationship between Africa and the East, well, uh, China has already highlighted it, uh, the win-win relationship which has been built, built with, with Africa throughout the years, starting with the, the colonization and so on. And so um, it's hard to go to any African countries and talk about uh, the Chinese colonization without um, talking about the political issues which are um, entrenched and implied. Um, so it has already posed or tried to pose as, a, as a, some kind of political, economical alternative to the Western vision of, the, of its relationship with Africa. Well, um, talking about the future um, and uh, talking about the whole East, which is not uh, only East Asia, but uh, the Middle Eastern uh, Gulf uh, countries, I think that um, the, the, the best way we can envision some, some kind of future uh, about this relationship is, uh, is when the West and the East will, uh, will be able to, um, to find some kind of uh, agreement uh, or some kind of economic uh, cooperation because right now I think it, it's not working very well. And, um, Africa is, uh, is, uh, is, is already paying these costs, and uh, um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Chagy? Yeah, um, I will let the economists talk more about the East West uh, China, China intervention. All I can say is that, um, yes, <clears throat> I've heard this term colonialism being used very much in, with regard to China in Africa. Uh, but I think there's a qualitative difference here because I don't see uh, yet, maybe later, I don't see boots and guns and bullets and enslavement of African people as European colonialism did. So there might be you know, future repercussions of what you know, China is doing right now, but certainly it cannot be compared to the kind of intervention, colonial intervention that took place with, uh, with the Europeans. So that, that's one thing. Um, about the leadership, yes, yeah, to an extent, I, I do agree that there is a, a generation issue here, that's for sure that every generation would like to take over. And in fact, part of the problem with Africa, <clears throat> again, at least with the regions I'm more familiar with, is that there was no handover to a, a, a newer generation. Um, if, if it did happen, it would have been simply to the children of those who started, the, you know, who took over in the first place. And so uh, it would be very difficult at this point to have that you know, change, change, change their ways. Um, with regard to um, the term Afro and African, uh, I, 
Again, my own view is that um, the African diaspora is simply one branch of the African peoples. And of course, the material conditions uh, within which the New World Africans, so to speak, have been in the last 400 years are different, but again, qualitatively, not too different. Because slavery and colonialism, I don't see too much of a difference in my view. So I would go more for a term that covers both Africa and the diaspora. Because in my view, we share a lot more than we differ. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So regarding China uh, East, yes, I just confirm Africa looks uh, East since, since uh, Southern Africa since a long time. I would say that exactly I would confirm what, what you were saying, that is, it is not a panacea. Recently, a bridge in a very uh, collapsed, just inaugurated in Kenya, which uh, has been a bit, uh, a bit uh, uh, worrying. Uh, I would say that the only positive dimension of China is that it is more players, just more capital. But also, uh, of course, China qual quality of project is, can be criticized, there are plenty of publication on that, but the uh, previous Western powers investing in Africa, building bridges and, and so on, didn't do so much better before because the white elephants and the list of white elephants in Africa since colonization, and I would mention my father was an engineer in Gabon, I should not mention that, so uh, first-hand view of the uh, effectiveness of the uh, project. So, uh, but more players, I think it's more positive. To the specific question is extremely important and interesting question. Uh, first, the cumul cumulative causation issue just highlight that we have many causes and vicious circles uh, affecting Southern Africa today. Of course, commodity dependence, and Nigeria is an incredibly disastrous example of that, you know, 98% uh, of export are oil, and it is absolutely a flat uh, curve. Uh, so the, the, the issue of commodity dependence, commodity dependence is the main element of this cumulative causation, not the only one. But, you mentioned control. The problem is international market and the, the, the comment in, uh, regarding commodity. So it is impossible to control anything. And this is why commodity dependence is such an issue because by definition, the price of commodities are decided not within Africa. Uh, older people like me know that Oufouet Boigny in uh, Côte d'Ivoire 20 years ago decided to control the price of cocoa and failed miserably because immediately the cartel, the oligopoly controlling the cocoa uh, uh, industry immediately precisely imposed to Côte d'Ivoire to stop the uh, uh, restraint in, in export that uh, decided by the president of Boigny. So it is impossible. The solution is precisely get rid of commodities, diversify, diversify, diversify. That is wise management can be that with windfall the coming from commodity, let's say during the good years of the 2000, would have been precisely to get out of this dependence on commodity. What does it mean? Industrialize. And it means exactly the issue of public policy, which I agree, not owning the economy, but incentive, that is to try, and it is extremely difficult, to identify within different countries, so, you know, case study, Nigeria it is not the same as Angola and so on or Gabon, just what could be the industrial sector, uh, the, whatever the comparative advantage, which can make that precisely some economies could find uh, the possibility to produce something else which is not a commodity. Because a commodity, even the IMF, they say a commodity is a shock. That is, if you produce only commodities, you are just exposed to shock to permanent shock and no economy can survive uh, in shock. And what do we need for that in the solution? Infrastructure. How can you run any industry if you don't have electricity, if you don't have water? And so on. we see exactly the complex complexity of, uh, of the... Uh, thank you very much. Um, be before we round up, I just perhaps maybe want to make a small comment based on the China. I mean, sometimes, I mean, the practicalities on the ground, I mean, there's a lot of materials Alice indicated in relation to what China is doing in many parts of Africa. But I have a very practical experience when I was working for the UN in the Sudan. I mean, it's, 
practical. Sometimes the states are caught in between the, the rock and the hard place. Now, you find Sudan was really under very difficult pre uh, pressure then. Most of the Western big countries, most of the Western countries were emphasizing. My mandate was really to push Sudan in relation to improving its civil and political rights, freedom of expression, good governance, and things like that. Now, um, Sudan was really concerned. They were emphasizing the fact that, look, yes, we will do this, but I mean, we are in their streets. Economic, social, and cultural rights are very, very important. I mean, schools, we want water, we want this, and things like that. Sudan wanted to build a big dam, but there was a conditionality. I mean, from the UN indicating that before, we, could, we, I mean, we will support you, but you have to improve your governance, your civil and, com um, civil and political rights. China stepped in and provided money to build the dam. Sudan jumped at it. Because, I mean, the truth of the matter is, I mean, in Yoruba language, there's a proverb again that, you see, dried meat, dried meat takes time to mature. Dried meat, when it matures, is very sweet. But you have to have something to eat before the dried meat is ready. You know, so, I mean, do you get the point? I mean, Sudan will not, yes, civil and political rights, Sudan was saying, look, uh, people need water. We cannot wait for this, for this to improve before we get the water. I went to the Chinese embassy because I used to visit all, I mean, missions in order to seek cooperation and things like that. The Chinese, I was talking to the Chinese ambassador in Khartoum indicating, well, you need to help Sudan in relation to improve its governance, civil and political rights. The ambassador was telling me, he said, look, if you want to promote freedom of expression, and he said, go to America. We will build schools. We will provide, we can build schools. We can provide water. You can, this is what, I mean, so you find sometimes there are difficult political decisions to be taken by the state in relation to the situation in which they are and what, for example, the West. I mean, at that point, if you begin to tell Sudan that, look, what China is doing now is sort of colonialism. It will come to haunt you. They wouldn't see it that way. I mean, they want water. They want, I mean, <laughs> they want a dam to provide electricity. They want these things. Also, so it has to happen. So perhaps maybe down the road, it might turn into another thing. But now, they see China as providing what is needed, infrastructure, as we, we, we've been saying. So thank you very much for the interventions. And uh, 